The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the uh, April 2018 ACRO webinar. Um, this is the second of our 2018 series, and we're very honored uh, today to have uh, two individuals that have uh, a lot of experience um, in um, various aspects of radiation oncology, but specifically, our topic today is going to be looking at kind of overall quality uh, of contouring um, and the importance of that and clinical implications, um, as well as providing a tool um, to assist with that um, that can be very, very uh, helpful in everyday practice um, and in teaching residents and medical students. Um, we'll also review a case of uh, post-operative fields uh, in the non-small cell lung cancer setting for N2 disease. Um, and first up today, we have uh, Dr. Erin Gillespie. Uh, she is currently an assistant attending at the Department of Radiation Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, as well as an adjunct clinical professor at the Department of Radi Radiation Medicine and Applied Sciences at UC San Diego. And specifically, she's the co-founder of eContour, uh, which is the resources uh, we'll be uh, looking into quite a bit today. Um, she went to undergrad at Yale University um, Medical School at University of Michigan Medical School um, and recently, uh, not too recently, uh, graduated radiation oncology residency um, from the University of San Diego or California, San Diego. She's had numerous awards and honors for research and honored uh, and we're very honored to have her as a part of our webinar series. Um, we also have Dr. Brian Lally. Um, he is a current a clinician of radiation oncology at Penn Medicine. Uh, Dr. Lally attended the University of Pennsylvania for undergraduate and graduate education, earning a bachelor's and master's degree in bioengineering, um, followed by the completion of his medical education at Thomas Jefferson University. He then uh, completed his residency in radiation oncology at Yale School of Medicine on fellowship at Wake Forest. Um, and he also obviously has uh, incredible clinical expert expertise with numerous influential publications in non-small cell lung cancer, amongst others. Um, and has been a co-author on the ASHRAE evidence-based guideline for SBRT for early stage non-small cell lung cancer, as well as the ACR appropriateness criteria for early, early stage non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, so Dr. Gillespie will uh, lead uh, this evening um, and go ahead. All right, great. Thanks, Dr. Mancini, for that um, generous introduction. Um, so as he mentioned, um, we're going to start. I'm going to first mention, obviously, that I have a disclosure that I, I was a co-founder in eContour, but um, this is a free website that's been funded by grants, and our, our primary goal is for education and research um, and not business. Um, a quick outline. Uh, so we'll talk just briefly about the clinical impact of contouring, and then some issues with kind of dealing with uh, information overload in the digital age and how we can kind of deal with that. And then kind of e what we're calling eContour 1.0, which is the reference website, which some of you may be familiar with. And then eContour 2.0, which is um, a web-based contouring platform that we um, uh, demonstrated at the ACRO annual meeting this year um, and is not currently live sort of on the website, but is available for um, certain webinar teaching sessions. So, and we'll get, we, we'd love to get feedback along the way or feel free to ask questions. So, um, you know, there's a number of clinical trials now, randomized trials that have looked at protocol deviations and correlated deviations with survival. And um, this one trial, the um, PROG 0202 study, I think best really defines this, uh, the, the contribution of contouring to uh, potentially survival. Because what they found was that um, in patients treated with head and neck cancer, and this was a trial of terpazamine, which is why you may not remember it since it was a negative trial, but they basically showed that for patients that had protocol deviations, their overall survival was reduced at two years from 70% to 50%. And these deviations, 25% of them were defined as being related to contouring or field design. Um, the other thing that they've, they looked at and has also been found in multiple trials has been that deviations really correlate with uh, volume of patients on trial. And that's also been shown in uh, vol volume either by center or volume by provider, meaning that the more often you do something, um, you know, the easier it is to do it right um, or to not, to not make minor errors or sometimes, you know, more than minor errors. 
And so they found that the rate of deviations was actually 30% if the center only treated less than five patients versus only 5% if they treated more than 20 patients. So this sort of lays the groundwork um, for really like, you know, a lot of our background data saying, I think we all appreciate that contouring it impacts our patients, both their survival or local control and um, potentially toxicity. Um, but now there's, there's, you know, increasing data to support that. So um, one thing that we did actually was at ACRO uh, now two, two years ago, um, we surveyed radiation oncologists. So one of my questions was, um, you know, one of the ways that we've sort of addressed contouring um, is to develop a bunch of consensus guidelines, um, publish them in journals. Uh, there's also a number of books out there. Um, uh, but we wanted to ask uh, radiation oncologists, how, how often do you actually reference these guidelines and um, what are your barriers to use? And what we found was, when, was that basically we tested them also, um, that eight, we tested them on eight uh, consensus guidelines and they were able to identify even the existence of the guidelines um, only about 40% of the time. And the, they said that the barriers to actually accessing these guidelines, which are obviously intended to help people um, contour accurately, uh, the barriers were really obviously awareness being number one, and then really the ease of use and not enough time, um, they weren't necessarily comprehensive. Um, issues like, you know, other guideline related issues that um, you can see in the medical literature are that they're not evidence-based or that the guidelines are not engaging, you know, the users are not engaged. Those were less of an issue actually with contouring. Um, so to some extent, it looks more of like, you know, an awareness and an access issue. So we developed this website, um, econtour.org, uh, back in um, the beginning of 2016. And it's basically a Again, it's a free website, but in order to view the cases, you do need to log in with your name and email address, which is primarily for us to be able to track use. Like we want to be able to see how frequently people are referencing cases and what cases are being referenced, just which is primarily for our research and development. Um, so the first thing that we did was we actually ran a randomized trial among about 24 residents at five academic institutions. We had them contour a nasopharynx case with any resource, and then they were randomized to using eContour or using any resource that they uh, wanted. And what we found was that eContour um, reduced the variation in the high-risk CTV, which is kind of covering the skull base, um, which is you know highly dependent on knowledge of anatomy, um, and that it also reduced the variation in the contralateral parotid. And when we asked um, users so we actually asked them to fill out a usability um, scale for eContour and it was highly usable but we also found that about 60 percent of users of uh, the residents were using you know nancy lee's imrt contouring book so we asked them to review the textbook as well it's in a bit of an ad hoc analysis um and the you know not surprisingly the accessibility of a web-based you know, 3D images was slightly higher than than just um, the textbook. Um, although obviously that's the textbook continues to be a very important uh, reference resource. So we then, you know, eContour has been out there now for about two years, and we have over 8,000 users. About half of those are radiation oncologists, and the rest are split. Uh, the second most common being dosimetrists or planners, um, and then physicists and some a few medical students. But their users are in all 50 states and about 122 countries, and um, just over 50% of that is U.S. So we have sort of a large and growing international population. Um, so the next step for what is, you know, really the reference website, meaning um, you can go to the go to the website, which you're free to do, you know, now or anytime, and actually just see cases that represent, um, you know, the the guidelines and, and have references. So the next step is really to build out what are clinical pathways, which via oncology is a common, um, well, it's becoming a more common pathway vendor in radiation oncology. Uh, and they have actually approached us to incorporate more image-based uh, information into their pathways. And the, the way that I think about pathways is kind of how I think about Google Maps in that you often will enter a patient's data or ideally, you know, the program will, will, will identify the patient's information. So the details 
you know, in something like breast cancer, like all the details of their um, hormonal status, their grade, you know, what surgery they've had, their stage, and, and take all of that information and help guide you to the, the inf- you know, the data that should drive your decision making and propose a solution. Um, and clinical pathways are one way that we've, um, you know, reduced variation, but also help you know, helps people find the information they need at the point of care when they need to use it. Um, and so, you know, that's one future direction for eContour. Currently, it's it's um, it's just a website that anybody can go and find it. Um, but this would be, you know, integrating more into the electronic health record um, at at in institutions that use the oncology. So then we also ask, you know, what about simulation to reduce errors? So we know that. Um, you know, auto segmentation has been something that has been talked about for a long time. Um, you know, and really, and, and, which is interesting. So I, I've started thinking a lot about the airline industry, which is why <laughs> my picture of the last airline. But um, you know, the way that the airline industry has actually dealt with auto segmentation has been to really identify, um, you know, identify the high risk. Uh, procedures that they do and really train them in a simula in, in a simulator because you know a lot of the time there it is sort of routine it is auto autopilot but they they have to be able to identify and actually intervene in the high risk uh, scenario so I think that moving forward the, you know an important thing for us as physicians to recognize is where we're needed um, you know as things do become we have more support or we have more um, automated things. It's really identifying where where does it where do our, our decision making impact outcomes, and how can we optimize our um, ability to to learn those things as we go through training. So, um, you know, at this point, I'll sort of stop talking. Well, I'll, I'll mention so so the next version, um, eContour 2.0. We invite all of you um, in this webinar to actually go to those websites and. Um, it's, this is the, the um, lung cancer case that we mentioned. It's at econtour.org slash acro. Um, you don't, do not have to log into the website uh, to access this case, um, but there are instructions on the right-hand side of the screen um, on how to actually enter the contours. And we, basically what you do is you select, you know, we currently have for teaching purposes just a single slice that you will contour on. Um, there are, uh, you know, a few node levels on this slice that um, you might want to identify. Um, you basically would click the checkbox on the left, um, the node stage level that you think we're at, contour that um, mm. using there's a pen and a brush at the top of your screen, um, an eraser, and then you can scroll through the image to kind of get a sense of where we are in the mediastinum. Um, and then, you know, you can contour out as many node levels as are relevant on that, what's called the drawable slice. So if you, if you scroll around and you, you get lost, you just click um, on the, uh, the arrow button right next to the pan, and that'll take you back to the slice we want you to contour on. Um, so we'll give people like a few minutes to do that. And then once you're you think you're done, you would click submit, which is that save um, green button. Um, and at that point, the um, you know gold standard contours, which will include all of the mediastinal nodal um, stations or levels, uh, will come on for your um, sort of, you can compare to your own contours. Um, and then, uh, you know, I'll let Dr. Brian Lolly take over for a bit and teach us about um, into uh, or contouring uh, post-operative radiation. Um, for an, a, a pathologic uh, N2 case. Um, so, and if anybody has, so I, if anybody has any questions, you know, either about what I've talked about so far, feel free to ask. Um, once I'll, I'll just throw this out there since I'm going to turn it over to Brian. There's also on that um, page that you go to uh, before you click on the lung cancer case. Um, the econtour.org slash acro is a survey there's a there's a survey that you can click on um and just give us some feedback about the session you want me to take over aaron um sure i guess we can kind of see how people are doing with um or you you can go ahead and, and talk while they contour or get a sense of um if people have questions 
That's fine. I just want to thank everyone for participating. I do apologize. Um, we went through the upgrade, the 15, ARIA 15 this week, and uh, having some issues, and we're still treating right now. Um, so uh, trying to work through that. And let me see if I have this working. Um, is If I put this over here, or is everyone able to see what's on my screen? Yep. Yep. Okay. So I didn't want to go through... Um, can you see it now, or are you seeing the opposite? Are you seeing the slides? Yeah, we still uh, see yeah. those, your slides. Okay. Um, is it in the presentation mode or the regular mode? Uh, presentation. Okay, perfect. So I didn't want to go into too much detail on what post-operative radiation therapy is. I just wanted to kind of hit some high points over five minutes um, as part of this webinar. And one of the things I wanted to begin is, you know, when you're in tumor board, what's the main evidence that you can use to support the use of post-operative radiation therapy in non-small cell lung cancer? Um, one of the studies I've been using more and more in my, you know, clinic or practice is the ANITA study. Um, and uh, hold on one second. I'll let you guys finish. Uh, something just, uh, I just got to sign a film real quick. All right, Aaron, I do have a couple questions that have come through, um, so we can take that opportunity to address it. So I think um, one thing that uh, others have noted in the past as well, um, obviously there's a very good question and answer site called the mednat.org um, where you can yeah. kind of specific clinical scenarios. Are there any potential thoughts uh, futuristically um, that people might have the opportunity to have more non-standard or case-based contours uh, for things that could potentially be more complex um, in addition to the, the quality of uh, kind of standard of care type contours? Um, I guess I'll just to clarify, do you mean having the ability to have somebody look at your clinical contours or just to have reference cases that are more like a, a wider variety of reference cases that include more obscure or like less common? Things? Yeah, probably the latter um, okay. of the two there, yeah. Because I, yeah, I mean, I think that the first, actually, if for those of you that um, aren't aware, just, you know, chartrounds.org is actually um, a program or that uh, a woman in Colorado named Patty Hardenberg runs, where you actually, every week they have um, a number of experts that log in and you can present your own case. Um, it's, so you have to be able to log in. We're, we're sort of partnering with her to try to figure out how can we actually bring experts to do remote case review at least um, so there's you know that that's a very difficult problem to solve uh, but I think it's an important one and something that um, at least chartrounds.org is currently in, uh, available but um, so certainly we are always looking to expand our content and um, finding ways to sort of do that in terms of partnering with people or um, institutions that are creating content that is uh, of of high um, quality is sort of the the trick uh, just so so if, if that makes any sense I mean there's there's opportunities potentially you know um, the red journal has the gray zone which they present examples sort of difficult cases and that might be one opportunity to kind of partner with them or even have the, the people that contribute written content to the mednet um, I've certainly started to reach out. Um, there's also, you know, so so it's really a you know, for us. It's the limitation is our bandwidth and finding um, as we expand and become more um, established is getting uh, content con contributed. Um, and so we're constantly working on that. We actually have um, the lung cancer and, and CNS cases should be coming online in the next couple months. Um, but that's sort of um, if, if the other the other question obviously is is how useful the more obscure cases become, um, and that's what the web analytics are important for is to actually be able to see what kind of cases people are referencing frequently. Um, I actually didn't show that, but um, you know, some of the most commonly referenced case right now is just the head and neck OARs, um, and then after that is actually breast nodes 
and then uh, pre-op rectal. And that's probably because, you know, those are, those are very common things. Um, it sounds like Dr. Lolly's actually back, um, so I'll let sure. him continue. Yeah, I apologize for that. Like I said, we had, the, uh, these upgrades are just a painful process as they work through the um, uh, issues. But getting back to what we were talking about, um, the main thing I use in my practice to advocate for use of radiation therapy uh, these days is the ANITA study. Um, in this study, it was a randomization um, for different patients for postoperative chemotherapy. Uh, the use of postoperative radiation was left to the institution. Uh, there was no randomization, but the institution had to follow their policy based on nodal status as to what they were doing. Um, and there was no real limitations for what dose they were using. It's just that they didn't want it concurrent with the chemotherapy. Um, but what's interesting is that when you look at um, the results, um, for patients with N2 disease who got, um, um, whether they got chemo or not, um, their use of radiation therapy tend to increase their survival, um, which is kind of, you know, what we think of are sterilizing residual microscopic disease that the surgeons aren't able to get out of there when they're doing a metastinal dissection. What's also interesting, because I've seen it as a board question from time to time, is um, for patients who have N1 disease, okay, and who cannot get chemotherapy, the use of radiation therapy has shown some benefit in terms of an increase in survival. Um, for patients with N0 disease, there was no benefit to the use of adjuvant radiation therapy. So um, what is port and what has it changed over time you know, we always talk about how radiation can be detrimental um, in the past. Um, and what they used to do, when you look at some of the older studies that were in the port meta-analysis, they were just treating a volume. Um, they were using a three-fill technique and trying to treat everything that was from the, um, uh, um, the, the sternal notch down all the way through and bounded um, by the lateral borders of the mediastinum um, in, in, you know, the two pleural spaces all the way down to about 5 cm below the carina. Um, they then began to realize the importance of doing computer dosimetry um, and checking simulator films in the late 80s and early 90s. And it wasn't until like the mid 90s with an ECOG study that I think Henry Wagner was one of the key people on that they realized that limiting the dose to the heart was critical. Um, so the question then becomes, what do you use or what volumes do you um, treat when you're using uh, post-operative radiation therapy? Um, again, when you look at some of the uh, uh, more recent studies, this was an RTOG study that they did, you know, in what we would consider modern times, RTOG 9705. It was just a single-arm phase two study, but they were, again, using that large um, kind of like uh, area between um, the lungs all the way from the bottom of like C5 to a couple centimeters below the carina. Um, but nowadays what we're using in our studies or what they're using as part of the lung art study, and the citation is there below at the right, was that depending on what lymph node is specifically involved, they tell you to contour the surrounding lymph nodes um, with a little bit of um, uh, specificity kind of like targeted radiation therapy. And as you can see here, um, you know, if you have one L, one R, two, one or two R involved, they suggest which lymph nodes uh, to include. Um, you know, what dose should you be using for post-operative radiation therapy? Um, you know, it's not like when we're treating uh, definitive cancer or locally advanced uh, non-operative patients, we want to try and do 50 to 54 gray. Um, and the reason is, is that when you look at a bunch of the studies that were included in the post-operative meta-analysis that was published in Lancet a while ago, you'll see that the patients that got the lower dose had an increase in survival in those clinical studies, but the, uh, the patients that, the studies that had the higher doses, especially those two French studies that you see there, uh, they were actually associated with a decrease in survival. So that's why you want to write your prescription for about 50 to 54 gray. Um, after that, somehow my computer is frozen now. 
And I think that's because all I have. So how do we get to look at those contours, Aaron? Aaron? Um, you can try, maybe refresh the page and then see if you can scroll through um, the submitted contours. Are you seeing them now? Are you seeing them now? Okay. Oh, you, uh, we're seeing Penn Medicine. Go back to the Google Chrome. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. So yeah, go ahead and um, kind of scroll, click on the station you want to look at, maybe 4R or 4L, and so, click on the um, word. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can you give me a little bit of the history with this case and what they had? Yeah, so, uh, well, this is a case that is um, was a right upper lobe tumor w involving um, the 4R node, um, status post lobectomy and lymph node dissection. Um, I had, you know, the case is described as just contouring on that um, one slice, like all of the nodal levels, um, but one question obviously would be if you just had a 4R node, um, what node nodal volumes would you include in your um, CTV? Uh, this specific case just has all of the levels contoured so that we can review them. Um, but you could kind of just, just select the, the levels that you would have contoured and what your, you know, kind of with your mouse, you could even show us what your general volume would have looked like. So, you know, as you were pointing out, if it's 4R, what I would have done would have been 2R, which would begin probably somewhere below the uh, aortic arch, excuse me, around here, going down to pick up 4R and 7 as well. Um, when I'm contouring around, you know, 2 and 4R, I try to stay as close to the carina as I can. I'm looking for a tool to contour. Um, I would say I would stick primarily in this area right through here and right on the front of the um, uh, the trachea as it goes down into the right main stem bronchus. Because to me, where do the lymph nodes live? The two and the four live right on the trachea. Um, the other ones tend to live on the vessels, except for seven, which lives kind of right underneath the carina. So I would be focusing on this area right here for seven. And I would probably go no more than a you know a centimeter or so in uh, inferiorly to kind of cover it as my CTV. And I also try to cover any clips that would be in the area that the surgeon would happen to leave. They tend not to do that in the mediastinal dissection, um, but I do look for that suture line that the surgeons will leave to determine uh, where the um, they cut at the uh, the bronchus. <laughs> So with the with the check boxes on the left, um, you can show the expert with the if, by just highlighting the word. You can kind of scroll through the user contours. Um, I think if you go down, um, yeah, I think on this case, like like you said, if you click four R seven and um, ten R, um, that probably includes like very specifically. I think in general. Still there? Yeah. Um, and then if you click 10R, or the hilum 10, yeah, where these are just sort of like specifically delineating where those nodal levels would be. And then one question I have for you actually, Brian, is that on the lung art trial, they specify adding like a 1CM margin to the involved nodes and to the hilum and to the bronchial stump which seems like it makes the CTV, I mean, this is a tight, you know, on the nodes and that would make the CTV a little generous, but do you, I mean, do you just contour a little more generously, I assume? So that was a great question. Um, I think what you're trying to say is this, is that, um, and we had this discussion at a recent meeting I was at, I find myself now tending to contour just the area that I want to treat with the CTV. Um, I, I assume, you know, look at the 4D to figure out what respiration is, is going on or how that's affecting my volumes. But I find myself trying to contour or shave the CTV out of different structures that I know are going to anatomically bound it. 
okay? Um, so there's no real reason to go into the um, carina, and there's no real reason to go into any of the different vessels per se. But what I find myself doing is not doing, um, once I make the PTV, my expansion is only like five millimeters these days when I practice, just because I feel more comfortable with that. Yeah, all right. Yeah, that makes sense. Because adding like a one centimeter CTV that you then have to carve off of everything sounded kind of interesting. I mean, that seems challenging and unnecessary. Um, so you're It makes the fields CTV. look like Texas. Right. Yeah. So you're obviously contouring your CTV and then uh, running your, you know, 40 video or going through all of your phases and then expanding your ITV, which is a bit different than if you had gross disease, obviously, and you were doing your ITV, but it's still general same concept. I'm sorry if I'm making everyone dizzy scrolling up and down. I'll stop doing that. Um, so you can, if you go over and you unclick um, the expert contours, you might be able to see um, just what people contoured for 4R, for example. Just go over to the to the arrows. Go so that's jump, and then go over to the arrow, the right arrow on the top of the image. Yeah, there you go. So people are so now you can see what people have entered for the 4R node at that level. So you know, um, let me see if we can do. Is there only one contour entered? Am I not doing this right? Uh, there could be only one. I'll pull it up on my computer too. Brian, another okay. question that come through. Yeah, go ahead. Is, uh, I was going to say, um, are you for port or even in your intact lung cases? Are you routinely getting your uh, CT sims with IV contrast? Don't yell at me for this one, um, but the answer is no right now. Um, we um, That's a great question. Um, and um, we recently did one of, um, one of these blue ribbon panels or astro panels, and we kind of said in this day and age, if you're going to be treating lung, whether post-op or, or whether um, locally advanced, you know, 4D and IV contrast is your standard. Um, that being said, um, giving contrast has um, a certain amount of logistical difficulty associated with it to have a reaction. So right now I'm not giving contrast, but it's on my wish list to put in there in the near future. Um, um, so I'm making the best that I can do with what I can. That being said, I do find myself now that I'm you know almost 10 years or more out from residency, um, contouring on a non-contrast CT scan is not that difficult for me. Um, I got a better sense of where the vessels are and how to differentiate them in the hilum. And I also use the PET scans a lot to try and define the target volume, whether it be post-operative or, or not per se. Okay? Um, but, you know, um, I, 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 it's just one of those things I found myself doing. Um, the other thing regarding contrast, when I'm getting follow-up scans for imaging, um, for surveillance, I tend to do those without contrast. I just, I only get contrast if I need it at that point for whatever reason. Sounds great. So another question that came through was um, sometimes people have difficulty in defining if, if for example, they are, there's a station eight lymph node positive um, and kind of where that's located if it's not specifically obvious in the thoracic surgeon's operative report. I think the most conservative uh, within the Chipet, uh, Contour and Al, uh, Atlas and others say obviously the most inferior border would be the GE junction, but obviously with that comes a lot of toxicity. I think in the setting of not having kind of all the information you might desire in such a setting, how inferior would you typically take station eight? I try to uh, use the radiologist and surgeon as references in contouring. Um, I think I've only seen that ever happen once or twice in my career. Um, 
but I, I try to go maybe two or three centimeters and, and use their judgment to assist me. Um, with the one time it did happen, it wasn't subtle. He left the clip for me to go chase. Um, but I was impressed that he was able to go get it. Great. Yeah, I will um, add that uh, these contours here were contributed by Jim Heyman and to reflect that Chapette uh, publication that you mentioned. And he actually included a Station 8 upper only, um, which is kind of what Dr. Lolly's describing is just several slices, um, probably about one to two centimeters uh, below the carina. So uh, presumably that's the, high, the highest risk area. I'm not really sure, but... Um, he had included that as separately, so I guess that's, um, I don't know if that was well defined in the paper itself, but. Great. Any other questions out there? So can I ask a couple questions of the audience? Yes, sir. Um, you know, so we're trying to, you know, um, use these webinars to uh, increase our outreach and, and, and things like that. Is there anything specific the audience would like to see, um, specifically with e-contouring, any disease sites or, or presenters or things to consider? Any results? Nope, nothing yet. And that if people do have specific things and uh, prefer not to kind of be unmuted, you can send a, a question um, via the questions tab below and I'll receive that on the side here. Um, and happy to verbalize um, those as well. And then um, if they if, if they want to submit like an anonymous like anonymous feedback from the session, um, that that survey link is at the econtour.org slash ACRO website where we'd be happy to hear any comments anonymously. Definitely. And I think for Brian, um, some of the things that we have heard in the past uh, have included um, additional online resources, obviously, in this day of age, um, that being kind of the most up-to-date and or interactive. Um, we're obviously also sitting at a computer throughout our days. So to have things like eContour.org is incredible. Uh, we do have plans to have an additional session with the Bendet.org and other kind of um, social media or online opportunities. Um, in addition to um, a meeting um, with one of the uh, leaders at Revenue Cycle to address non-clinical issues as well. Um, but we're absolutely would love to hear back from everyone um, about different disease sites and, and things that are particularly clinical challenge that we can be able to assist with. Um, we've had uh, another uh, recommendation come in from one individual saying that they would love to see um, DI sessions particularly. So as we know, that can be a challenging one and we'll definitely take note of that. One other thing that I've been submitting with the scientific committee for the annual meeting was to have individuals present on how to create an abstract, how to present a paper, how to write a paper. Would that be beneficial? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think especially for new practitioners and everybody else uh, in academic medicine where that is something that, uh, and not, uh, where that is something of interest, I think um, that can reach out to a lot of people with useful tips and tricks. Um, there was a specific question kind of um, specifically for this session still as well, but um, as far as how both Aaron and Brian, um, how you utilize your 4D scans for contouring. Um, if you don't mind commenting on that, kind of, we kind of bridge on it a little bit, but in the intact setting um, versus post-operatively, kind
kind of what your margins are. Do you do the IGTV or ICTV or somewhere in between? Um, that's something we just got through. So um, I create, um, uh, and I, you know, assume it's locally and, you know, intact, non operable. Um, I create an IGTV and an ICTV and all that. Um, I really um, look at the motion. Um, uh, you don't see much moving in the mediastinum, but if you go out into the lung, you'll see more motion. And I like looking at it in all three uh, views um, uh, because you just never know, you know, how the motion, um, especially if you have like a, a pulmonary nodule that's more peripherally, uh, how that thing is going to have hysteresis or oscillate in different directions. So I tend to follow it along those lines. Um, but, you know, from the, uh, you know, I create the ICTV, ICTV and then I expand it by five millimeters to create a PTV. Great. How about yourself, Aaron? And can I add one other thing before Aaron chimes in? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, when I'm creating that CTV, I'm shaving it out of the heart, shaving it out of the rib cage, shaving it out of the spine and the esophagus. You know, anything I can do to avoid toxicity. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I have actually, so at Memorial, my main two two disease sites have turned into breast and lung. And um, so I've been, I mean, it, so I've been doing some of this now uh, more often. And um, I mean, in my in my experience, when you have a, an ITV, you're, you're, it's kind of tricky because yeah, you contour your CTV on um, you know, the, the planning scan. And then I run the 40 movie and I'm basically trying to imagine the volume that I was that I contoured in my CTV and then just sort of expanding it wherever I see motion where um, like it's the carinal, the subcarinal area, like if the vessels are moving away from the carina, you know, just expanding it to include that. Um, I don't find, I find that there's not usually a ton of motion on these post-operative cases, but it is nice to know that um, I can sort of shrink my PTV by having a 40 scan available and that I am accounting for that one. Perfect. Yeah, and then another question, um, kind of more on the line of planning and other things. Obviously, um, the the right definitive dose is something, and what volume should or should not be treated, obviously, is going to vary from institution to institution. Um, but Brian, do you see kind of any trend toward maybe dose escalation in the future? Obviously, we have data uh, with 60 versus 74, but um, what has been your experience kind of in some of the discussions of uh, astro and acro and other type of um, leadership within the thoracic oncology world? I mean, we, again, through some of these panels you sit on, they try and create guidelines or statements and so forth. And they, they try to do it in a way not to penalize um, the uh, treating physician in case they were to pick some dose. And there tends to be ranges depending on whether the, the patients get chemotherapy or not too. And these discussions are always interesting discussions to have. Um, you know, personally, you know, I'm treating to uh, 70 gray in a definitive setting. Um, uh, I feel like to do it best, you do it two gray a day, 180, I, I don't believe in. And I just find myself these days um, trying to, to shave that CTV out of any uh, organs at risk um, to, to help minimize the toxicity. And that's just the way that I've adopted it. Um, I think it's going to be hard to find arguments to um, um, go through and do another dose escalation study unless they get, you know, solid reason to believe that um, X, Y, or Z, um, like heart dose or lung dose or esophagus dose, is what we really got to be considering as we dose escalate. Uh, doing it blindly, I just don't see them doing again. At Memorial, I would say we're a little bit um, more, uh, 66 is our upper, and then, and for the more central um, sort of abutting the mediastinal lesions, we'll definitely just do 60. 
Um, but, you know, just it is hard because there's no good, you know, heart constraints necessarily. Um, but we know that there was heart toxicity at high doses sort of centrally. Um, but certainly peripherally, I, I agree that you go um, higher um, if you if you can. And, um, you know, we know from SBRT that certainly uh, there's a dose response in uh, non-small cell. I, I do think this, to add to what you're saying, though, I, I think the heart dose is critical. But I also think the esophagus and, and the lung dose are also critical. And we just don't know from patient to patient which one is the is the the most important? I suspect there's probably some relationship of all three that's critical. Yeah, that's a great point. Are there William specific... Blackstock used to teach me if you don't respect normal tissues, they will hate you. Yeah. Do you see a trend in any of the um, lung parameters? Uh, kind of what is expected. Um, as far as V20 mean or V5 with the use of IMRT and others, do you see any major changes, again, kind of in, in those behind-the-scenes types of conversations? No, it, it, I just keep following the data, see what comes out there, and find the best way to apply it. Um, at Penn, it's nice. We have a whole lung group, and they, they kind of help set those standards together. Um, so I, I can't, you know... Um, you know, think that one thing is better than another. Um, it it's, comes back to uh, sometimes these constraints, if they're too tight, they're too hard to meet, and it right. just creates problems. And um, I just think when you look at lung cancer, um, there's so many different types of disease. Um, people who have just, you know, a small tumor and minimal N2 involvement, versus multi-station with a five centimeter tumor or eight centimeter tumor, it can vary so much. What I do think um, you're seeing a little bit is that um, the locally advanced population is not there to where it was 10 years ago. Um, we have these patients all over our clinics. And, and nowadays you just don't see them as much because I think with better PET scanning and everything else, um, when you look at the NCCN publication that Jamal puts out every year, the incidence of the um, locally advanced population is diminished from what it was 10 years ago by, I think, about half or so. And the stage four has increased. So I, I really think that um, it's just not there as much as it used to, uh, it used to be. What I do think we see more and more of um, is the need to re-radiate because the, the 60, 70 gray has such a high local failure rate um, that you're finding the need to, to explore, you know, a second or sometimes even a third course of treatment. Um, and what volume can you get away with with what dose without causing injury? Um, uh, it, it, you're seeing the lung cancer become more and more of a chronic disease. Yeah. And speaking of kind of chronic disease, some questions have come through about um, kind of treating or any dose modifications with people on things like Optivo or other type of targeted or immunotherapies. Are you routinely changing practice um, in the setting of either definitive or palliative uh, thoracic radiation? I mean, if I'm trying to, ah, oh, man, if I'm trying to palliate, that's different. I mean, I'm just trying to release symptoms and um, I primarily do 300 times 10 or something along those lines. Keep it simple. No need to get fancy. Um, but I do see um, a lot of people trying to um, prime the pump with the immunotherapy to kind of create that obscopal effect. Um, and, you know, um, I think, you know, at Penn they have some data, or here we have some data, where, you know, it, the, the largest single fractions tend to be better at doing that. But it's one of those things. It's like it's great when it works, but when it doesn't, you're left kind of scratching your head trying to figure out how to make it better. Um, you know, it's an interesting to see. I get the feeling it's going to lie more within the mutation and the and the inflammatory pathways to try and figure out who's the best candidate for that approach. You know, to try and, and do it and get that epscopal effect and who not to. Absolutely. 
Aaron, have you noticed anything with at Memorial as far as practice changes or, or other modifications with immunotherapy or other targeted agents? Um, well, yeah, it's something we're going to talk about in our team meeting because we're seeing more and more med onks really wanting to start immunotherapy like like on radiation either because they couldn't get, you know, they have discontinued chemo or they, you know, are palliative. And we we generally do agree with the 30 and 10 for palliation. Sometimes if you get into like what, you know, these more oligoprogressive scenarios and you're doing aggressive palliation, um, sometimes we'll, you know, the party line on immunotherapy and, ra and radiation, particularly higher dose radiation at the same time, is just, there's not a lot of data. Um, we think that it's it's probably safe. Um, it's probably, they, I mean, they, they're, they're, there's like, a, I guess the, the main issue is pneumonitis risk. And I'm curious, um, Brian, what your, you know, if you think that that's of concern, I mean, we've gone forward treating, um, you know, no, just counseling the patient that it could be higher risk, but we're not really sure. So what, what I don't know what your thoughts. Uh, same. Um, I agree with you. You know, um, I had someone this past week that was a re-radiation case that finished re-radiation, and um, the med uh felt bad because he opened up, he got treated with uh, uh, radiation and chemo, standard chemo, and then was going to get immunotherapy afterwards. And the medical oncologist felt bad because he opened up the idea of doing immuno to the guy. The reason he felt bad was the first course of treatment he had, he had um, a bad pneumonitis afterwards. Um, I, I think, you know, in a lot of these cases, you're trying to um, go for cure. And, you know, you have to balance, um, you know, the opportunity to go for cure versus the risk of toxicity. And it's not an easy, you know, balance to perform, and there just is very little data out there. Um, and, and I love it because, you know, um, you know, if you get pneumonitis, just give them some steroids and don't worry, it'd be fine. But that approach I find flawed because if you're giving them steroids, then you're not letting the immunotherapy have any real benefit for the patient. Yeah, sure. Yeah, very good points. There's, All right. You know, there's also some thought that the mechanism of pneumonitis is different from immunotherapy and radiation. So we don't actually know if they're additive or if, you know, some of these patients are just at high risk with anything. So. Great point. Anyway, sorry. All right, yeah, and I uh, just have one more question right now, um, just to make sure we squeeze it in before the end of the hour here, but um, kind of switching gears from non-small cell to small cell, um, people have wondered kind of what uh, dose and dose fractionation you'd be using for small cell um, nowadays for the majority of your patients. Oh, man. Um, if I can get away with it and the patient looks good, I'd do 45 BID. I think that's what evidence supports, um, I guess, you know, but I guess based on convert, you can make the opposite or say there's no difference. I just don't see that type of patient in small cell lung cancer anymore. Um, you know, so more of what I've been doing is trying to take them to 70 gray. I just find that easier and less concern for toxicity. Um, and if you treat them BID, that's a lot of work for the patient to be in your clinic twice a day. So the, the 70 gray, I think, is becoming, you know, more and more what I just use because it's easier. How about yourself, Aaron? Um, it's interesting. At the end of residency, I went to Royal Marsden and, in London, and their, the convert trial had just come out, and they were emphasizing that the convert trial had really, you know, the survival was not significantly different, but BID looked favorable. And so, and when I got to Memorial, um, so their standard in the UK is BID, and at Memorial the standard is BID. And if the patients, you know, we we have we we enroll on RTOG0538, which randomizes them to 70 in dailies or the BID. Um, but if so, if patients can't tolerate it or they refuse BID, then we'll do daily or try to get to get them on the trial and randomize them. 
Um, interestingly, the trial actually includes a replan at like 44 gray, um, which these cases do shrink quite a bit. So that'll be interesting. Uh, a di a di another difference between the two arms on the trial, R2G1. But for small, so I think 60 gray is just no man's land. Yeah. All right. Well, very good points all around, and um, no other questions are kind of in the queue over here. So um, just thank you very much to both Dr. Lally and Dr. Gillespie. Um, awesome co topic of a conversation, very useful tool. Um, I'd like to, again, encourage everyone to check out econtour.org, and please fill up the survey uh, that Erin uh, presented at the end of her talk um, to just continue to uh, assist with process improvement and improvement of kind of all everything related to eContour and um, uh, the tools and everything that we can provide um, through ACRO as well. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can always send us an email um, and feel free to reach out at any time. Um, but that will conclude today's webinar. And again, we appreciate everyone's time uh, to be on today. Have a great night. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.